is good. Come on, God bless you guys. Praise the Lord. Let's be seated. Let us all be seated. Come on, this is excellent. As old as you are. You know, it's one thing to be in God's presence and to know that God is here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on. <laughs> Oh, and that is all we need. The presence of God. Oh, that presence is better than any present. Come on, it is awesome. Amen. Jesus is Lord. Do you know how many people here, how many people like to know that the person you're talking to is actually listening? All the women, yeah? I think so. Oh yeah. Because sometimes men don't care. If you don't listen to what I'm saying, you're about to find out. <laughs> I was just warning you. But women want to know that you are actually listening. And, and I mean, to be honest, let's, let's, let's be frank. Okay? Everybody likes to know that they are being heard. Emmanuel, you may have to help me a little bit because... I was trying to sing like the people up here and I think I did too much. So my voice is a little down so you may have to boost me up a little bit. Oh, that's good. Praise the Lord. Because you know sometimes, you know, the Bible says, let no man think of himself more highly than he ought to. And I'll be here sometimes feeling like I'm a tenor singer. Especially when I hear Brother Ron, I hear, you know, Diamond, Anita, and Shayla, they, you know what they do? Come on, let's celebrate these folks, everybody. And then, occasionally, I'll be hearing Manuelita trying to outsing me. I'm like, come on, Manuelita, come on. And, and, and that, that does this to my voice. Doing too much. But you know, when it comes to giving God praise, you can never do too much. You know, I would rather lose myself and lose my voice so that it all becomes part of the sacrifice. But I'm excited because what I felt or what I know was that whilst we were singing, God could hear us. It is a great feeling when you know you're talking to somebody and they can hear you. As we were singing and calling his name and, and just telling him how magnificent he is, I knew that he could hear us. God is good. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We're just going to go ahead. Um, um, I'm actually just going to release you guys. Yeah, so that we can get right into it. But while these guys are dismant dismounting the stage, I want us to quickly take a look at a couple of scriptures. One of them um, being Matthew chapter 12, verse 7. Matthew chapter 12, verse 7. You know, <laughs> already... There are people here who are beginning to experience or have encounters that they did not ask for. You know, on Saturday I was saying it, that people will begin to say, but I don't even remember asking for that. And just as the word of God came forth on Saturday, that as long as I did not ask to be born, I can always expect glorious things to happen to me that I did not ask for because of the one who made me and set me here. One of the things that we know in scripture is that almost everybody that we read about in scripture that God called was called to do something that they did not bargain for. Oh yeah, because if you're living your life based on your dreams and ambitions and aspirations, you haven't started because God is so, uh, what's the word? The way God operates is whatever he has for you is always beyond what you can imagine or what you can come up with. You understand what I'm saying? It is always beyond you. It's not, it, it, it's his, he holds the reins over your life. The Bible says that we are the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified so God was the one who planted us here and that is the reason why Jesus says we have to bear fruits 
for him. I can't remember, or I don't even think it's possible for a mango tree to eat its own mangoes. You understand what I mean? No. I mean, you can't see a cow just feeling peckish and then, it, you know, decides to squeeze its own milk. And so, you know what? These human beings must like this milk and it's mine. I'm going to just take some of my own milk. Whatever it is that we are seated here to do is beyond us. We are the planting of the Lord. Let's take a couple of examples real quick. Remember when God called Jeremiah. Jeremiah was like, are you talking to me? Because all of what God was saying was too wonderful for the dude. When God called Gideon, Gideon was like, uh, you want me to go tell somebody? Because, I mean, you know me. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. And I'm the least in my father's house. I mean, you're, 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 you're telling me about war, about raising an army. I'm here. I'm a farmer. Can't you see what I'm doing? Are you? Did you get the wrong address? You see what I mean? Because what God has for you remains a mystery until he himself unfolds it. The Bible says it is the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of kings to search it out. I mean, David could not have imagined. I mean, come on. Even in his own household, he was not recognized. He was a bastard child that was not even allowed to show up around the house without notice. Because you remember that his father was the head of the Sanhedrin and the fact that he had a child from an abusive relationship because he took advantage of one of the maids in his house in a very complicated um, order. He didn't want people to know that David even existed. And that was why David himself said, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Because J.C. never married the woman. And so David knew also that he had older brothers who had been trained in the military. And so if any one of them, if anyone was going to become king, it wasn't going to be him. Israel up until that time had ever had only one king. And he was from a wealthy family and he was his father's favorite child. And up on top of that, he was the tallest man in the entire nation. The Bible says he was shoulder above everybody else. He only became king because basketball had not been invented. <laughs> Otherwise, he had no business ruling. He should have just been bouncing and dunking. But I tell you what, David would not have thought. He was a shepherd boy and he was pretty good at it and he was okay with it. When everybody else went to war, he went to feed his brothers. He didn't even go there as a motivational speaker. Because you know, before motivational speakers became things, motivational speaking became a thing for social media. Back in the day, motivational speakers were people appointed by the kings to go and encourage soldiers who are getting discouraged. You understand what I mean? So he didn't even go there to say to them, guys, I know the battle's been long and hard. You know, he went there as an errand boy. And then the plan of God started to unfold. You see, no matter what it is that we think we're seeing, it is not it unless God is revealing it. You might be passionate about making clothes. You might be passionate about making lemonade, whatever it is that you do. But let me tell you something, what God has for you, until it is revealed, you cannot make it up on your own and you cannot, you cannot just wake up and cook it up. You can't fathom it. So let us go to Matthew chapter 12 verse 7. And look at what he says. Matthew 12, 7. It says, but if you had known what this means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is the Lord, even of the Sabbath. He says, if you had known. That the Lord desires. Now Jesus was quoting here. Hosea chapter 6 verse 6. So basically Jesus is saying. Y'all don't get it. God desires to show mercy. Why? Because he is full of mercy. Let me say that again. You see quite often. Whatever it is that you are full of. You want to 
flow so that you can be at ease. You understand what I mean? Remember when you were still in the world, before you were saved, whenever you visited two or three people and they gave you gossip here, gossip there, and you're full of gist, what do you do? You're looking for someone to divulge the information on. You too, you'll be looking for somebody to say, have you heard? Have you heard? But it's okay. You are redeemed. You were just practicing preaching the gospel. So don't abandon the gift of have you heard? Just make sure this time around you're not talking about people, but you're talking about the Lord. You see what I mean? So whenever we are full, the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Do you know there are times wherein you are so full of thoughts, even without having anybody to to share it with or without having come up with a way to present your thoughts, they escape you in the form of sighs. You just have to, hmm. And that's because when you're full, you need an expression. I don't want to talk about all the other nasty stuff like if you've eaten too much and you're too full, you want to express. Oh, let's talk about one that isn't so nasty. A pregnant woman or a nursing mother, if that baby is not receiving the milk after a while, it becomes uncomfortable because the woman is full and she wants to release and express. And Jesus was telling the folks right here that God desires to show mercy. Why? Because the Bible says that he is full of mercy. God is always looking for someone to show mercy to. But because of the fact that when you live your life as a recipient of the mercy of God, you cannot be boastful. And human beings like to boast. That is the reason why we created the culture of, 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 of works wherein we just want to be a part of our own success. We want to be a part of our own story. And so we, we would like to tell people the reason why God is blessing me is because of all the sacrifices that I made. The Pharisees believe that other people should remain subservient to them when it comes to the things of the house of God because they have made so many sacrifices. They stand in the synagogue and they watch people wearing different clothings of different colors and they're like, hmm, we have to wear black all the time. Oh, we're doing all of these things for God. All these people walk around. No one is keeping tabs of, on how many times they have prayed. But as a Pharisee, you need to go to the board and check the number of times you have prayed because it's part of your assessment. And that is the reason why they go to the open squares to pray so that their bosses can see that they're praying because they want a promotion next year. You understand what I mean? Because of the fact that they have become accustomed to doing things that they can take credit for. They ignore the mercy of God. And Jesus came and he said to them, the Lord desires to show mercy rather than receive sacrifice. David was like, if God would receive a sacrifice, I would give one. He says, if you want bulls, I've got lots and lots, loads of those to give. He said, but alas, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Why? Because when you're broken, you're ready for mercy. Only broken people beg God for mercy. Why you, let me tell you something. If you, if you think, oh, I, have, I can't even remember the last time I sinned. I haven't told a lie since the spring of 86. Uh, I, I have forgiven everybody, at least I think. I, I mean, I don't miss a beat on my tithing. I, I, I give. You know when you are in that kind of state of mind, when you go before the presence of God, you're not asking for mercy because what do you need mercy for? You, what you want is you want to be acknowledged for all the good things that you have done. You go in the presence of God and that was what was happening. And Jesus cited the examples of people like that who go in the presence of God just to tell God how good they are. But we come to the presence of God to tell God how good he is because we know that we ain't. You understand what I mean? And so when you live like the Pharisees, so dependent on your own ability and good works, you do not leave room for the mercy of God. And because God is so pent 
up. He needs to express the milk of mercy. He will overlook you because you are not helping yourself, neither are you helping him. He will go and find somebody who will say, have mercy upon your God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my iniquities and wash me clean of my transgressions. David said that prayer because he recognized that he had been a bad, bad boy. And Jesus is saying that is exactly what the Lord is looking for. And what is interesting was Jesus said that and he followed it by saying, because the son of man is the Lord of the Sabbath. He's saying, I am the Lord of rest. So if you are not in rest, you are not in me. And those people have no rest because they believe that they have to be the ones to make it happen. Let me tell you something. We work and we labor because God commands it, not because that is what our lives depend on. The Bible says that it is not of him that wills, nor of him that runs, but it is of God that shows mercy. You see, you can be doing the same thing that God has commanded whilst some other person is getting blessed for it, you are getting stressed over it. But you're doing the same thing. I can't be coming here every Tuesday and every Saturday preaching and teaching and be stressed while somebody else is getting blessed. You know why? If you are doing it, it is not what you do that matters as much as why you're doing it. The understanding behind what you do is what makes all the difference in the world. If I do this because I know that the Lord is gracious and merciful enough to give us the opportunity to gather here and in obedience and receive of the gift of the Holy Spirit, of the unction. If this is the reason why I'm doing it, then I'm going to be blessed for it because I'm not doing it thinking the more I preach, the more I will progress in life. But if I think that, oh, if I don't preach, no one's going to buy my books. I'm like, I've not even written a book. I'm like, oh, if I don't preach, I'm not going to have a lot of followers. But I see a lot of people who have millions of followers, but they themselves have long, long lost their way. And so it cannot be because of all those things. It can only be because of the fact that he is the one who planted me that he may be glorified. And so I labor not because of the fact that I believe that my labor will prosper me, but I labor because it's obedience. God commands it and doing it. But my prosperity is not a function of the labor. It is a function of his mercy. Because the Bible says there is he that withholds more than he needs and yet he ends up in poverty. The Bible says the race is not to the swift, neither is the battle to the strong, but time and chance happens to them all. If I want the labor and the sacrifices that I make to produce the results that he promised, then I have to do those things recognizing that no matter how good I am at doing my assignment, I still need the mercy of God. I cannot discount the mercy of God. There is no substitute for the mercy of God. We cannot get to a place of complacency or a place of sanctimony where we believe that we no longer need the mercy of God. Ask for the mercy of God even when you think you're doing right by the word of God. Ask for the mercy of God even when you feel like you are on top of the things that are of your assignment. Ask for the mercy of God anyway, for without the mercy of God, there is no engagement with God. The Bible says, come boldly before the throne of grace, wherein you obtain mercy, first of all, and then grace to help in time of need. If we do not obtain the mercy of God, we have nothing. We cannot even see his face. The mercy of God is so fundamental, but the enemy makes sure all the time that he continues to encourage humanity to create and foster cultures and paradigms of self-righteousness. Jesus said to the Pharisees, if you know that God desires mercy over judgment, over sacrifice, you will not condemn 
the guiltless. Because we do that all the time, don't we? We look at people who have wronged us who are not even feeling bad about it. You understand what I mean? They, they have just done that. Okay, I'm waiting for them to come and apologize. Even if you don't apologize, at least acknowledge what you have done. We are so obsessed with people acknowledging what they have done. But if you know that your Heavenly Father is not looking for people to punish, but people to love, then you will get off your high horse of wanting to see people pay for their sins, and then you'll get off that and, want, and, and, and begin to desire to see people forgiven. You know, Jesus told his disciples, he says, the authority that I have given to you is for forgiving sins. He says, I have given you the authority to forgive sins. Whosoever you forgive is forgiven. And I want to tell you today that you need to start with yourself. Many of us, we are holding ourselves in derision. You are holding yourself to ransom. You are holding yourself in unforgiveness. Do you know how many times people who claim to be born again, who are new creations in Christ Jesus, still blame themselves for what they did when they were 12 years old? Do you know that every time we look back and regret our actions, we doubt God? Every time you look back and say, ah, if I had known, but, but you didn't know. You keep saying, oh, I shouldn't have done that. In fact, you know, the one that you didn't know is, it seems easier to forgive than, than the one that you knew. Because there are times where you, were, you, you know what you were doing. You know that boy is no good. You know that the fact that he comes to church means nothing because in your heart, you know that he had no fruits worthy of a believer. You knew that he was like a running lion coming to church seeking whom he might devour. And after knowing all of that, he invited you to come and pray with him at his house. And that he was going to be alone. So you people would not have any distraction. You knew and still. You were like oh maybe, maybe, maybe this prayer is the one that would change him. Maybe just this one. And now 18 years later. You keep looking back full of regrets. Do you know that every time you look back like that. And you regret what you're saying is. Your life would have been different if you had done that. So are you trying to say what you do is what makes your life? What happens to the one who is the author and the finisher? Every time you look back and you regret your actions, you are saying that the word of God in Romans chapter 8 verse 15 is not true. You are saying that the word of God in Romans chapter 8 verse 28 is not true because the Bible says all things work together for good to those who love God and the ones who are the called according to his purpose. And that is the reason why you are not at rest. And if you're not at rest, Jesus is not your Lord because he says, I am the Lord of rest. He says, I am the Lord of rest. And that is the reason why you need to choose mercy because if you're choosing sacrifice, you would always be judgmental to yourself, to other people, and you'll be demanding sacrifice everywhere, even demand sacrifice of your own self. Do you know that there was a time in my life that God would speak to me and I would pretend like I cannot hear him because I don't believe I've done anything worthy of his voice. Because I'm like, I haven't even fasted in a week. Uh, yeah, I've been reading only two chapters a day. So what is this voice that I am hearing? Satan, get thee behind me. Because I was of the opinion that I had to do certain things to get his attention. And he just wanted to love me. You understand what I mean? I sold myself short and missed out on those opportunities because of the fact that I felt like I needed to qualify for them. And so you know what God did? God allowed me to get spiritual. He allowed me to get spiritual. And someone is like, is that a bad thing? It could be. Because I started to pray for several hours every day. 
I will fast and lose count. I got to the point where I felt like, yes, at this particular point in time, bring me water. I want to walk on it. And after the Lord allowed me to get spiritual and I was enjoying it, I realized after a while that it wasn't working. The only thing that it was doing for me for the most part was making me feel good about myself. You see, the Lord did that because the Bible says the Lord gives grace to the humble. But the one who is not humble yet, <laughs> the Lord will teach you humility. I did all of that and certain things in my life at the time that needed to shift were not shifting. I wasn't having results. I was just having fun, having all those spiritual exploits. Don't get me wrong. Those spiritual exploits are great. They are amazing. We need to build ourselves up in that fashion, but we must not get to the point where we believe in them more than the mercy of God. God wants you to be able to expect him to move on your behalf, even on your worst days. Because that is what it means to receive the mercy of God. If God is only going to be good to me when I am good to others and good to him, then that is not mercy. I am earning my pay. It becomes a transaction at that particular point in time. Because, oh, I'm only expecting good because I've been good. No, you need to recognize that the only thing that guarantees the goodness of God in the life of a person is the mercy of God. Because you know why? The Bible says there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it is destruction. There are certain things that you have told yourself, this is the requirement, this is what I need to do. But then at the end of the day, the Bible says it's like filthy rags before God. The Lord is telling us that it is time for us to elevate our understanding of the way that he deals with us above what we can do to focus more on what he has done. You see, quite often we spend more time thinking about what we're not doing enough of than we even think about his goodness. Look at how much time we spend beating ourselves up for not doing enough. What happens to the one who has done everything that pertains to your life and godliness? The Bible says he has completed it all and given to you all that you would ever need. And so when am I going to spend time adoring God and magnifying him for all of what he has done? I want to say this to you. If I, let me show it to you. Come with me to Psalms 11. I'm going to show you two verses of scripture from the same chapter. We're going to start from verse 3, Psalms 11, 3, and then we're going to look at Psalms 11, verse 7 also. Verse 3 says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Let's read verse 7 and then we'll come back to verse 3. Verse, verse, verse 7 of Psalms 11 says, For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. The word his countenance beholds the upright is actually uh, how do you say it? The statement is kind of like an ambiguous statement when you look at it in Hebrew. If you have a really good Bible, you will see that there is a footnote in that place that says that the righteous beholds the face of God. That the upright beholds his countenance, which is consistent with what David had said earlier when he said, which he said later, I believe in Psalms 34, when he says, we beheld him and became radiant and knew no shame. To become radiant means to become purified, to become righteous, and then to become what? Uh, to know no shame means to be glorified. So David says it was when we beheld him that we were justified, and when we beheld him, we were also glorified. He's talking about the fact that righteousness comes from his face. 
So basically, you don't become the righteous so that you can then see his face. No, it is when you behold his face that you become the righteous because the Lord himself is the righteous one. Every other person is just trying. That is why when Jesus died and was raised and we became justified because of his resurrection from the dead, the Bible says we became the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now I want you to follow me and let's go back to Psalms 11 verse 3. The Bible says if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The foundation that we have in our natural selves was already destroyed because Adam was the first foundation. And so no matter any one of us, no matter what we do in the natural and in the flesh that we call righteousness, God is looking at you and saying, well, I see you're trying to do some good works here. But what is that good work based on? If your goodness is based on your humanity, if it's based on your carnality, then heaven does not recognize it because if you take $1,546,000 and you multiply it by zero, the outcome is a magnificent zero. You understand what I mean? Because the foundation, if it is not Christ, everything that you build on top of it, is not recognized by heaven. So God is saying, I want you to do good works. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 16, he says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your heavenly father. But you see, those good works are only good in the face of your heavenly father when they stem from the righteousness of God as opposed to from the righteousness of men. Many of us have become so hurt by other people simply because we, we, all of what we did for them, we did because we thought they were worthy of it. You understand what I mean? Let me tell you something. If you have any plans of being in the ministry, like a pastor or something like that, don't love people because you think they are worthy of it. Oh, because sometimes you're like, man, that person is one of our most dedicated people. They don't miss a beat. They this and this and that and this and that. And if you now commit yourself to them because of their commitment to you, you're setting yourself up for a big fat disappointment because the Bible says the arm of flesh shall fail. But we need to learn to love as we are loved. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners and enemies of God, God, Christ died for us. You understand what I mean? So if you love people because of the fact that it is the nature of God and it is the nature of the new creation that you are in Christ Jesus, you will never be disappointed. At least not for long. We're still human beings every now and again. You feel the blow in your belly because the Bible says that a tail bearer releases tasty trifles. You know, when somebody does something like that to you, that someone that you've trusted and they turn around to disappoint you, it hurts. But then if that foundation of your love for them is Christ, then it is a solid ground that cannot be moved. Multiple times people have asked me, it seems you find it easy to forgive people that have hurt you. Sometimes you're even open to having them come back and be in fellowship. I say, well, yes, because even though I receive a blow, my recovery is spiritual. My recovery is divine simply because my commitment to them, I do my best possible to ensure that it is rooted in Christ and not in them. And even better, make sure that it's not rooted in me. You know, because sometimes we are kind to people because of how they make us feel. It's about you. That person just, you know, when they're in the room or when they're partnering with you or anything, you just feel great. So you're not even doing it for them. You're doing it for you because of how you feel. Let me tell you something. One day they may do something that will make you feel bad. And if your love is based on how you feel, then you will start to hate in that moment. You will start to judge in that moment. You would want to demand of them all of the sacrifice that you have made. You would want to call some people down and say, all the hours that I spent praying for you, release it back now in Jesus' name. You know, because you would feel at a loss. 
But the Bible says that if that foundation is faulty, that is where you will be. At a loss, all of your righteousness, all of your sacrifice, all of your love and commitment will be reduced to nothing. But if the foundation is Christ, and what does it mean for the foundation to be Christ? You did not merit Christ. None of us did. We were destined to go in the way of Adam, just unto corruption. And God was like, okay, upon whom I will have mercy, I will have mercy. I have had mercy on you. Here is this lamb that is forever. So I'm giving you my son as an eternal sacrifice. Believe on him and come out from where you've been. Now, if that is my foundation, that the life that I now live is no longer mine, that was heading nowhere, but it is now the glorified life of the son of God, then why should I take it personal, anything that comes out of that life? If that is my foundation and I love because of him, then whenever it is that I am wounded, I would also be healed because of him. Why? Because I am at rest and because I am in him. You see, whatever we do that we're not doing from a place of righteousness, from a place of rest, is work. And after a while, you'll be tired. And if you're doing it out of your own ability, it can never please everybody because some people just aren't going to like the way you're doing it, period. Anyway, so, but then if it is rooted in Christ Jesus and it is rooted in the fact that, wait a minute, wait a minute, I, the I that I think I know has been crucified with Christ. Paul says, nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live is the glorified life of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The reason why many of us struggle to live like that is because of the fact that sometimes your human experience cannot distinguish between a memory and reality. When you give your life to Christ, you were indeed crucified with Christ. But you see the old nature, the avatar of the old nature continues to run its script in your mind. And so sometimes you forget that that thing is already put away with. It's supposed to be dead and gone and forgotten, but we forget that it's already taken care of and we allow it to rule our lives. Jesus said, why do you seek the living among the dead? Let the dead bury the dead. But you follow me. You are no longer that person. Whatever it is anybody does to you, remind yourself, oh, it's not to me because I am dead and gone. This life is the glorified life of the Son of Man. They have done it to the Lord Jesus. And so if Jesus is not taking offense, why should I take offense on his behalf? Jesus said to the disciples of John, he said to his disciples, after the disciples of John came to challenge him, they're like, man, our master was born so that you can be the Messiah. He did all of that for you. All of his life, he was your forerunner. And now he's in prison and you wouldn't even pay him a visit. Jesus knew they were offended because they didn't come to him in a friendly approach. Of course, they tried to be respectful. They were speaking in parables, but Jesus, knowing their heart, knew that all of their diplomacy was hiding their grudge. I mean, let's think about it. The reality of it is, these people, John was their pastor. They got saved under John's ministry. They got baptized under John. And now their pastor was arrested. And the same person whose existence, I mean, their ministry was, ex was there because of Jesus. The least that Jesus could do even if he wouldn't use all of his supernatural powers to break John out of jail, he's at least visit him or acknowledge that he's there. But there was nothing. And so they were like, are you really the one or should we look for another? What did Jesus say after he said to them um, in a very nice way? That's a very foolish question. That was what he said. He said, because have you not seen the blind sea and the lame walk? So what are you asking me exactly? You know, I like that because sometimes we forget that our fruits can speak for us. Recently, I heard that someone says she's no longer coming to communion house 
And she's angry with my wife and I because when people say they're not coming, we don't beg them to come back. And I'm like, uh, I'm only going to beg you to come back if I, had, if I didn't do right by you when you were here. But when you were here, I gave you the best of me by the grace of God. You understand what I mean? And so this time around, I'm just going to let my fruit speak for me. But if you don't like what my fruit is saying, and you only want to hear what my flesh is saying, then you are not of me. You see, Jesus taught his disciples to deny the people who denied them. He says, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my heavenly father. And that was why when Simon the sorcerer was trying to pay for the gift of the Holy Spirit, the apostle said to him, if you keep thinking like that, you have no part in this work. Not everybody has a part in what God has called you to. And so when they are telling you to come out and be doing stuff in the flesh, no, thank you. Look at the fruits that I have borne. I have borne the fruit of obedience in your life. I have borne the fruit of forgiveness in your life. I have borne the fruit of intercession in your life. And so what is this sentimental plea that you want that speaks louder than the fruits that I have borne? If that is what you're asking for, you're not going to get it. Please, bye-bye, see you later or never. Because at the end of the day, people are planted in the church straight out of the kingdom of darkness to introduce cultures that are anti-Christ. They want you to do things that Jesus said not to do. They want you to do things that Jesus warned us against. But because that's what people practice in the world, they want you to practice the same thing. That foundation is faulty, and I'm sorry, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I can't do nothing about your faulty foundation. I'm sorry. Abandon your faulty worldly foundation and embrace the glory of God. So the reason why you want to come back is you want me to massage your ego so that you can feel good about coming back. Oh my goodness. God forbid that I will cast my pearl before swine. You see, you see, how do I know? Because I've tried it before. I've done it for years. It didn't work. Until one day in 2014, we were having a small groups. I mean, we were having a house fellowship that we were hosting at our house. And many people signed up on Sunday at the church. About 28 people showed up. And I saw two and a half people. There were three people. One of them was on his phone half the time. So that was a half a person. But 28 people signed up or so. Might have even been more. And I was like, oh my God. Where are these people who signed up to come for the small group? We didn't see anybody the next week, maybe three or three and a half people. And so after service on Sunday, myself and the other small groups leaders were talking and they were like, oh, I need to do better at calling people. So when I heard that, it occurred to me that, oh, maybe that's why people didn't come because I didn't call them. So I was trying to attend to all of my clients during the week so that I can make time to call these people. And once I was done, I was going to grab the phone and the Holy Spirit said to me, if you start out by begging them to come, you would always beg them to stay. I was like, what? He said, yes. He said, do you want me to bring people who are of like passions? And the Holy Spirit asked me, I would never forget. I was standing between the door and the staircase going upstairs. That was when we lived in Swanee. I stood there. I was frozen in my tracks. And he said to me, he said, who begged you to open your house for fellowship? Who called you to say, oh, you need to be a blessing by hosting this fellowship? I said, nobody. He says, I called you. That's why you're here. And there are others that I have called also to come and join you here. Wait for them. It doesn't matter how long it takes. If you would wait for God, you would have the best of him. You see, because quite often we look at other people and how they seem to be getting ahead and we're like, oh, I want that, I want this, I want that, I want that. And God is like, what about all the amazing things that I have for you? And you're like, God, yours looks like seven years away. Uh, I'm good. This one is seven minutes away. I'm going to just take this one. 
You understand what I mean? That's what we do. And the moment the Holy Spirit told me that, I'm like, that's it. I am not begging anybody to come. Little by little, we started to grow. You know why? Because, you see, so <laughs> yeah, even that was when Manuel Leader showed up, you know? Yeah. And so, I tell you what, we started to grow because our fruits were speaking for us. Fruits don't sound like works. They may not be as flamboyant. They may not even seem as compelling to the carnal mind. But to the ones who are supposed to be with you, they will recognize that you have the real stuff. Because the Bible says deep calls to deep. You understand what I mean? You know, there are people who have lots and lots of people around them. I was telling my wife, my wife and I were talking the other day about certain people who came around this work when it started, when Communion House started. Several people came around and they came promising heaven and earth. They came saying, we're going to be here till Jesus comes. In fact, I remember there was a guy who came from out of town. I'm not going to say where he came from. And he said to me, oh, my wife and, her, my wife and I were here uh, f forever. I said, no, you're not. He said, what do you, he said, no, we are. We are here. We're committed. We're not going anywhere. I said, no, you're not. And I said that because the Lord already showed to me that it was only along for a while. But then he was trying to convince me. And so since he would not listen to what I was saying, I let him continue to enjoy his fantasy. Because I knew that the Lord had revealed to me that he was only here for a little while, but he was trying to do everything to convince me that he was here, that he was there forever. The Bible says Jesus, knowing what was in their hearts, did not commit himself to them. So the day that he said himself and his wife were leaving, we already had a party planned. We continued our party. And he was like, aren't you going to, I said, going to do what? I don't have to change anything because I was already prepared for this day. You are the only one. You, because if the foundation is faulty, what did you want me to do? If the foundation is faulty, what can the righteous do? You understand what I mean? If you are here because of your ambition, I cannot compel you to embrace the commission. So it is your business, your prerogative to go and dissect and divide and sever yourself from ambition so that you can then follow the Lord. But if you haven't done that, I am sorry, I cannot help you. Many people came around the work, but one by one, the Lord will reveal to me, this one is here for this reason, that one is here for that reason. And that is the reason why I am still alive. Because if I had committed myself to them, my blood pressure would have gone through the roof. I would have been in depression. You know how they say the majority of pastors in America are in depression? Yes, because the Bible says the arm of flesh shall fail. So when you're leaning on the arm of flesh instead of the everlasting arm, you are setting yourself up for a roller coaster of emotional experiences that lead nowhere but agedness and tiredness. But I still need to love on people and serve people and check on people and call people. But the same action needs to be done with the same, with a different heart. So I'm still doing the stuff. I'm still calling people. I'm still texting people. I'm still checking on them. But I'm not doing it because I believe that if I don't do it, they will not come. I do it because I have something to give. I do it because I'm a messenger on assignment. If I call you to pray for you, it's not so that you can come to church on Sunday or Saturday. I call you to pray for you because there was an unction that was stirred up on the inside of me to pray for you. Because if I'm saying that I'm doing that so that you can come, what if you don't come? Then I will make the grace of God of no effect. The Lord desires mercy because he is full of mercy. He wants to be merciful. And so if I know that the Lord wants to be merciful, then whatever it is that I do, I do relying on the mercy of God so that I can be effective by being at rest. You understand what I mean? 
I can be effective by being at rest. One of the people who worked the most in the Bible, his name was rest. Remember Noah. Noah means the Lord's rest. But how many people worked as hard as he did? He was one man who built an ark that all the animals fitted in. Even his sons were not that happy to help him because they were like, man, this man, we don't know what you heard, but what flood? It's never even rained. Imagine a people who had never seen rain and then you now tell them there will be a flood because there was no rain until the flood came. The first time it rained on earth was the rain that became the flood. Because it's there in scripture, the Bible says up until that time, water came from the depths of the earth, not even dew from above. It was mist coming from the belly of the ground. So people could not comprehend the idea of water coming from above. And so the man was alone and he pretty much had to do most of that work all by himself, but his name was rest. So to be at rest doesn't mean to be lazy and do nothing. It only means to do it leaning still on the mercy of God. I'm going to love people. I'm going to serve people. But I'm going to trust in the mercy of God to keep them consistent until they can be fruitful. I'm going to depend on the mercy of God to keep them consistent until I can see Christ formed in them the hope of glory. I'm going to keep doing it believing in the mercy of God to keep me encouraged and to keep me fortified to continue to be a blessing as the Lord intends for me to be. So even though I am laboring, I am not getting weary simply because I am expecting my result to come from the mercy of God as opposed to from the efforts that I make. Because Jesus is not the Lord of works. He is the Lord of rest. We're going to look at one more scripture. In fact, that verse 3 is very loaded. If the righteous, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? I'll take us through one more scripture and perhaps we're even going to break bread with this one. Come with me to the book of Romans chapter 4. We're going to read Romans chapter 4 verse 12 and we're going to read uh, verse, I think it's the last verse, 19. Romans chapter Four, did I see four? Romans chapter four, verse 12. And we're going to break bread with this. So one of the conversations that I had with the Lord was that today, the captives will be set free. I remembered when the Lord said to me about two weeks ago, a week and a half now, when the Lord says some of the strongest bondage that the enemy has over God's people is religion. We do a lot of things religiously because people told us that that was the requirement. That you had to do that. And at the moment, Satan saw that, wow, these people are free, but someone sold them chains and they have willingly put it on. Well, you're making the work of the kingdom of darkness easy. We're just going to continue to encourage you that those chains are good for you. So religion is what Jesus was addressing when he told the Pharisees because the Pharisees came to challenge Jesus and his disciples not because they had a revelation but because they had a religion and Jesus' disciples who had a revelation that they were with the Lord of rest were now being castigated by the Pharisees. The disciples had found mercy. That was the reason why they could stretch their hand on the Sabbath to take grain and grind it up to eat with the, and rub it up to eat without feeling guilty. You know, that was the Pharisees' problem. The, their, their problem was not even with the fact that they ate on the Sabbath from rubbed hands because you're not supposed to rub anything on the Sabbath like that because that is you doing work. The, the problem they had, they didn't say it. They told Jesus, uh, why are your disciples doing this on the Sabbath? But Jesus was like, I know your problem. Your problem is the fact that you see them and they don't look guilty. That's why he says you will not castigate the guiltless. Do you know that if the Pharisees had come and said to the disciples, Peter, James, John, what are you guys doing? Bartholomew, don't you know it's the Sabbath? And they're like, oh my God, we're sorry, we forgot. They'll be like, it's okay, we're just going to pray for you. Make sure you bring two total doves next synagogue day. And we're just going to pray for you. They would have felt needed. 
You understand what I mean? Which again is the reason why many of us are not enjoying the mercy of God because we try to be God in the lives of other people. We want other people to need us. You understand what I mean? We want them to feel like, oh, without me in your life, you, 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 you have a trouble. No, nobody needs you because even you are not enough for you. You understand what I mean? The Bible says, let no man take this honor unto himself. No, you're not enough for you, no matter who you are, no matter, I don't care how much money you have in the bank, how many degrees you have, how long you've been at your job. It doesn't matter. You are not enough for you. The breath in your nostrils, snap of a finger, it's gone. We all live by the mercy of God. But some of us, we want to be God in the lives of other people. The Pharisees were angry because the disciples were not sorry. Jesus says, you are angry because they, they are guiltless. They did not acknowledge any guilt. I'm not saying to continue to accommodate people who are just intentionally annoying, who just keep doing stuff. You see what I mean? You rebuke people. The Bible says open rebuke is better than love that is carefully concealed. So there are times when I tell people, you've been doing this thing since last week. Now it's time for you to stop. You understand what I mean? But if they choose not to stop, I am not going to now start hating on them and condemning them. No, I pray for them to find mercy. You understand what I mean? So these Pharisees were people who were just so after guilt. They want people to feel guilty because the more guilty other people felt, the more righteous they felt because they pride themselves on what they can do. And so if other people are not doing it, then that means what they are doing is now of no value. So we're going to read these two verses of scripture, but I, I want to make something very clear from this story of the Pharisees because I believe that we are to be free from the bondage of religion. Whatever it is that you do, ask yourself, am I seeing this action of mine as a privilege or am I seeing it as a requirement? It is a privilege for me to be able to preach, teach, and prophesy. It is not a requirement. If I think that I have to teach, preach, and prophesy so that I can become someone important in the body of Christ, then I have missed it completely. Being able to preach, teach, and prophesy is a gift. It is a function of the mercy of God. You understand what I mean? So when I see my actions and the abilities that I've been given and the opportunities that I've been given as a privilege, I am more likely to live in gratitude than in pride. Because if you're living in gratitude, you will stay humble. David says, my soul makes a boast in the Lord. The humble hears of it and he is glad. You understand what I mean? But if I think it's a requirement, then the moment I do it, I feel like I fulfilled the requirement and I'll be posing somewhere waiting to be paid. Like I've prophesied. Can't they see that I prophesied? I, they should come and pat me on the back. Come on. That prophecy came to pass. Now, every time we fulfill requirements, we have an expectation for a remuneration. That is the way we're wired. You want to be paid. It's like once you go to your job, you're waiting for that paycheck because you have fulfilled the requirement. I have showed up. You know what we say after every day's work? You're like, now they owe me. They owe you nothing. The Bible says, owe no man nothing but to love. It is an opportunity and a privilege to be able to go somewhere and be of service and be useful. For crying out loud, we are but dust. And dust is so abundant everywhere. So the fact that you are now with the breath of life and able to make a difference, you should always see these opportunities. We should always see these opportunities as privileges, not requirements that we are able to fulfill. It changes everything and it does allow for the mercy of God to be able to come into your life. You see, because the mercy of God will not come and contest with your own feeling of fulfillment by requirements. You see, if you keep thinking, oh, I've already done this, so now I'm going to get that, then the mercy of God is going to say, well, since you already have works to present to the Father, I'm going to look for somebody who has nothing 
but mercy. You understand what I mean? But a plea for mercy. So when we understand this thing, I'm going to read to us one more scripture actually because I want us to get it. Because I had this conversation with the Holy Spirit and he said to me, it is critical for us to abandon religion. We need to give up religion. Religion, in another way, can be defined as a set of practices that we have concluded upon to be required for our merits of things that are beyond our ability. A set of practices that we have all concluded upon that are requirements for us to qualify or to merit privileges. That is what religion is. Religion says, oh, if you wash your hand before you eat, then God is not going to allow for you to have stomach pain because you have washed your hand. You understand what I mean? If you do this, oh, then you're going to get that. That is what religion is. But mercy is saying, regardless of whether you've done well or not, you recognize that you need God to smile on you before you receive. So you make it about the face of God. The Bible says that the Lord is the righteous one and the upright finds righteousness in his countenance. When the Lord looks upon you and smiles upon you, then you find righteousness. And that is what mercy is. And so if we don't recognize that, we will continue to have false expectations that are dictated by religion and it ends in shame. And disappointment. And I know that the Lord is going to help us to undo the unfruitful works of religion in our lives. Romans chapter 4. We're going to read uh, verse 7. The Bible says, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. And whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall impute no sin. Abraham, yeah, that's the, the next title. But this particular verse of scripture was, um, I think Psalms 32, Psalms 32. Psalms 32 verses 1 and 2 was what Paul was quoting here to the Romans. He says, blessed are you whose sins are forgiven. Blessed are you the one to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. I want to encourage you folks. Stop limiting what God wants to do in your life because of your past mistakes. The Bible says it's covered. Stop walking as though you walk around God as though you're walking on eggshells because you don't want to offend him. Whilst God is looking to see the beauty of your existence. You see, there are certain things that God has wired into you that he wants to see. He, he wants you to, your life to play out like a sheet of music that bring, brings pleasure to him. But you're always so afraid to express your thoughts, your creativity, your service to others because you don't want to offend God. And God is like, no, I want you to live and have that life more abundantly. Let your consciousness of him be greater than your consciousness of sin. Many of us are so conscious of sin that we take extra caution that then limits us. But if you're more conscious of his love, let me tell you something, you will not be reckless, you will only be faithful. If you're thinking that the liberty that you have in Christ is going to lead you to sin, it's because you are still conscious of sin more than you are conscious of his love. We just need to trust him. We just need to trust that he is the one that is at work in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. There are times when God just sends you. He wants to send you to go and minister to someone, to go and encourage them. But guess what? You're busy thinking, man, I can't say the wrong stuff because they're very judgmental. If I say this, they might be thinking that I mean that. If I say this, no, 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 just say the Bible says Jesus speaking to his disciples. Do not premeditate what you will say. Open your mouth and I will feel it. I will feel it. Just go. And if they misunderstand you, if they judge you wrong and they don't accept your gospel, Jesus already gave you a way out also. He says, dust your sandals and walk away because they did not receive you. Is their problem? I'm going. I've done what the Lord has asked me to do. Let's not be overly careful. Because most times that is what stops us from being able to pour out what is on the inside of us. Now verse 12. 
In fact, I think we should go to verse 19 because if we go to 12, we'll be here for another 10 minutes. So Romans chapter 4, verse 19. The Bible says, And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Let me tell you something. This scripture set me free from lots and lots of chains that religion brought into my life. Abraham received a son from God after his body was dead. While his body was alive, no child, at least not a child of promise. God waited for his body to die. So that when that child comes, it will become apparent that it is not by his power, nor by his might, but by the spirit of the Lord. A lot of us, we have struggled because God wants us to get to the point wherein we recognize that it is not by power, not by might, but by his mercy. And the moment Abraham recognized that, what did he do? He started giving glory to God. Give glory to God for what you have done in the past that you didn't do right. Give glory to God for that, saying, well, God, this is one of those things that shouldn't work for me but because of your mercy it will work for me give glory to God because if you don't begin to do that I'm not just talking about trying to delete those things and forget about them I'm talking about you bringing it to the table and letting God know that you recognize that he is able to turn it around for your good you should be able to come before the Lord and say God I, I knew that I shouldn't have left out of the job and I shouldn't have left that city but I did because of my own recklessness, because of my own restlessness, because of my own impatience, but because my life is not going to be by my own abilities, but by your mercy, I give you glory because I will see these things work for me. I don't know how, but I know that you will make it work for me. Verbalize the glory and you will begin to actualize the peace. Speak it forth and it's going to come forth. Break free from religion. Religion, again, is those set of rules that you have been told that you must obey to have the promises. No, it is all by the mercy of God. And lastly, the third scripture that I said we're going to read and then we're going to break bread. Again, um, let's go to, let's go to, um, Ecclesiastes, actually. Let's go to Ecclesi Ecclesiastes chapter 7. And we're just going to read verse 19. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 19. And this one is what we're going to use to break bread. The Bible says, Wisdom strengthens the wise more than ten rulers of the city. Wisdom strengthens the wise more than ten rulers of the city. Many of us, we need to divorce ourselves from the mentality of I am going to be able to do this because of my own strength. The Bible says 10 rulers are nothing compared to one man who is acting in the wisdom of God. Let me say this. There are people who are believers, born again Christians, who believe that they are only ever going to make a six-figure income if they do this and if they do that. And do you know that they may not even have consulted with God whether they should do this and do that. The reason why they concluded on that is because that was what Joe Blow did. That was what Mary Ann did. That was what Stella Johnson did. And so they're like, oh, I'm going to do the same. But what if the Lord would have you achieve that income by another means? Wisdom is what? The consciousness of God. The Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. That fear refers to acknowledgement. It refers to consciousness. The moment you begin to become conscious of the mercy of God and you start giving glory to him, he will release wisdom to you that will achieve things that the strength of ten rulers cannot 
achieve. And the reason why this scripture is important is not just talking about 10 strong men. It's talking about rulers. And who are rulers? People that enforce the rule of law. Religion. All of those laws that you have made for yourself. If I don't do this, I cannot be that. No, those are not the requirements. Mercy is the requirement. May we learn how to plead for mercy. May we learn how to step aside and let the mercy of God reign. May we learn how to rest in him even while we work for him so that things can work for us in the mighty name of Jesus. So as we break bread today, I want you to say, Lord, I need your wisdom to replace all the customs that have been working against me. I need your wisdom so that I can operate like it is heaven on earth. In the mighty name of Jesus. I'm going to just quickly say a prayer before we break bread because this is what was revealed to me. I see people in the spirit holding the Lord's body and they've got gloves on. And these gloves have become rusty, filthy. Some of them have actually got mold on them. And they want to take this bread. And the Lord said to me, tell them to take it off before they take the body of Jesus. And in that very moment, I saw the angel of the Lord with a stick in his hand pointing at a board with instructions explaining exactly what the process is. And I knew that it was a moment of deliverance. And so I want you to have an expectation right this very moment to engage the mercy of God, the intervention of God for deliverance from the stronghold of religion. Religion has been that glove that you have put on to protect your hands from being contaminated. Many of us took on various religious practices because we were told that that is how we're going to live and not be defiled. We took on religion as gloves in a filthy world to keep us holy. And now that the Lord is bringing us his mercy and true righteousness, we have failed to Benefit from it because we didn't take off the gloves of religion. And so right now in the mighty name of Jesus, I'm going to read to you some of the things that I am seeing. In fact, I'm seeing four things on that board and I'm going to read them to you. The first one says, believe in the Lord. Many of us, we believe more in ourselves than in the Lord. Believe in the Lord. Tell yourself if the Lord is able to do it, I am able to receive it. If the Lord is able to do it, then I am able to enjoy it. Believe in the Lord. Thing number two, with your mouth, it says, undo your old commitments. You have limited yourself in the past by saying, oh, until I get to this age, I won't be able to afford that. No, undo those things that you have said. It is rash for a man to devote a thing as holy and afterwards reconsider it. That's what the Bible says. And so you have said, oh, until this is this, until that is that. If I haven't gone to that Bible school, I cannot be in the ministry. I cannot even preach the gospel. No, undo with your mouth the commitments that you have made to works and to religion. The gloves are coming off in the mighty name of Jesus. Thing number three, is very simple. The Lord is the provider. You need to know it. You need to believe it. The Lord is the provider. And he will give all the mercy that you need. The Bible says as long as the sun rises upon the earth, the mercy of God is renewed day by day. He is consistent. He will deliver the mercy that you need. You will not run out of mercy. Now, the thing number four that is written on the board says all you need is his blood. All you need is his 
blood. I speak to you today to receive this into your heart that the blood of Jesus is enough for you. It is all that you need. And that blood of Jesus is the life of Jesus. And because that blood is what purifies you and cleanses you of sins, it is that blood that makes heaven not impute iniquity unto you. Always be confident in the God of your salvation. Speak freely with the one who loves you. He's not judging you, he's loving you. When you stand to pray, stand by the blood and know that your sins are forgiven. When you are thinking and building up an expectation in your heart, build it by the qualification of the blood and not on what you have done or what you can do. And I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus, yes, the gloves are coming off. Oh, hallelujah. This is amazing. The angel of the Lord called my attention to one of the people in the room who took off their gloves. And I saw the other hand never had any gloves on it. And the Lord said to me, they put that hand away because that was their weakness. They never thought much about it because it's their weakness. They didn't get religious about that hand because it is their weakness. And I saw that hand come to take off the gloves from their right hand. I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus, that on top of the deliverance that you have received today, you will see the strength of God made perfect in your weakness. In the mighty name of Jesus, you will see the strength of God made perfect in your weakness. In the mighty name of Jesus. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in Jesus' name. The last thing that I'm going to do here today before we take up the offering is very simple. Most of what I've shared with you today has got to do with you recognizing who you are and what the Lord has done for you that you need to embrace. But the Lord is bringing my attention to one more thing. Remember when Satan went to tempt Jesus, Jesus was like, oh, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He said to Satan, you shall not tempt the Lord your God, but him alone shall you worship. But Satan did not leave him until he said, get thee behind me. The Lord is saying that with what you have heard and with what the Lord is staring up on your inside, with the four instructions that are written on that board, many of us are now equipped to be able to confront the enemy. But the Lord does not want you to focus only on being able to defend the position that you are taking in Christ Jesus. The position of rest the position of depending on the mercy of God, God does not want you to be obsessed with defending that position just because that itself could become an exercise that the enemy keeps you engaged in all day long. Wherein you keep hearing the voices and you're like, oh, now I know the scripture. Now I know this and that. No, you have work to do. So the Lord wants you and I to silence the voices of religion, the familiar voices that keep pushing us and prodding us, that keep engaging us and keeping us busy unnecessarily. You see, many of us have suffered so much paralysis because these voices keep coming and we want to analyze every thought. We want to make sure that, oh yeah, yeah, well, I've taken care of this thought. I've taken care of this notion. You know what I'm talking about, how you just get so paralyzed sometimes, trying to make sure that you're doing right, trying to make sure that you are checking all the boxes. Get thee behind me, O Satan. I want to specifically pray for people here who might have struggled in that area in the past. Maybe even up until recently, you've struggled to actually have some silence in your mind because there are so many thoughts, so many competing voices trying to tell you what you must do. Even something as simple as leaving your house to come to service. You just have all of these many voices and you, you want to shut them down. You quote scriptures, you do this, you do that. And you are tired because they can be tiring. And so if you want me to pray with you, just come up real quick. We'll make it a quick walk of righteousness. I just want to agree with you.
that those voices are getting silenced. Jesus had to silence Satan. He said to Satan, get thee behind me. Because if he hadn't said that, Satan had nothing else doing. He was happy to stay with Jesus and continue to try all kinds of approaches. Jesus had to shut him down. You know, I'm talking about the voices that sometimes make you feel like you could be schizophrenic, like they keep opposing you. They're getting silenced in this place today. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I thank you. Now for the people here who may have been called to operate in ministry similar to me, let me just quickly explain to you some of the things that I do to help me fulfill my assignment. I do not put premium on exegesis and a flow of preaching. I don't put as much premium on what I think is my flow as much as I put a premium on the flow of the virtue of the Lord. So there are times wherein I pivot the message by the leading of the Holy Spirit away from a flow of eloquence because I know that sometimes that is just satisfying emotionally. But I am pressing in to see the captive set free. So if you notice that towards the end of my message, it was almost as if I was picking my words and I was slowing down. It's because I am like, okay, we, we have words. Paul says, I, we don't come to you in the eloquence of men's wisdom, but we'll come to you in the demonstration of the power. I was pressing in because I'm like, people will not live here today still haunted by familiar spirits. We have to break the chain. And you know, the Bible says the testimony of the Lord Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. When you're committed to seeing people testify to the glory of God, the Lord will send you his angels. You will see the scrolls open before you and you will prophesy. So let us come close. Please come close. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, every one of you, as soon as I hold your hand, just give me your right hand and say with me, get thee behind me, O Satan. I am free from voices of familiar spirits. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let me say this. I'm just going to warn you. When you're free, it is only for a season. It's not like, oh, you're forever free now and you won't hear them again. No, Satan still came to Jesus. But the Lord wants to give you a breather because he's the Lord of rest. Use your rest wisely and use it to move quickly in the mighty name of Jesus. God bless you. Get thee behind me, O Satan. Get thee behind me, O Satan. I, am free I am free to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. To hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And not familiar spirits. And, familiar spirits. and not familiar spirits. In Jesus' name, I silence those voices in the mighty name of Jesus. You will hear the Lord obey and be quick unto righteousness in Jesus' name. Get thee behind me, O Satan. I am free to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and not familiar spirits. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, so let's come close if we can. Just let's come close very quickly. And this applies to you all that have already prayed for um, so, the windows have to be open. The bad air has to leave. So, come close. Please come close, as close as we can together. So, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you because we are gathered in the room of prophecy. That which you showed to me. Now, let your angels who are ministering spirits assist us because of your mercy. We are supposed to open the windows ourselves, but we have help, don't we? Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, hands that have to be taken, feet that have to be led, eyes that have to be opened to see and be able to open the windows. Let them begin to receive the help that they need right now. Your feet will be led to where the window is. Your hand is going to be enabled and your eyes will see and you will open the windows and the bad wind will leave. In the mighty name of Jesus, Father, I thank you because there is enablement in here today. The captives have been set free. Let the bad wind leave the room in the mighty name of Jesus. And you will hear the voice of your heavenly father. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, let me tell you something. This woman right here, 
From today onwards, you will no longer doubt your salvation. Every bout and every season of doubt, of confusion is over. You knew that was for you already. In the name of Jesus, whom the Son says free is free indeed. You belong to your heavenly Father. Your heavenly Father belongs to you. You have received righteousness as a gift. It is not what you have done, but what he has done. So, exercise the authority to forgive. Yes, let go, let go, let go, let go, let go, let go, let go. He set you free. You can't hold yourself against yourself. No, 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 no. Yes. He loves you. You too love you. Love yourself like he loves you. And that is what will keep you grounded and confident in this salvation. In the mighty name of Jesus. Yes, renounce every one of those works. Renounce every one of those thoughts and, and thought process and habits. Renounce those mental habits. Your, your men, you see those habits for you, they are mental habits. Almost like you're, 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 you're caught within the circuit of those thoughts. No, 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 no. Renounce them, but just know that you have already been free. You are blessed. You are enabled. You are empowered because you have beheld his face. And now you are radiant. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, and he is your Lord. I want you to say, Jesus, you are Lord. Kim Sorotandelia. So call your name and say this, Jesus, you are the Lord of Moses Anderson. I want you to say it and call your name, say, Jesus, you are the Lord of, and they say your name. In the name of Jesus, you are free. The weight is off your shoulders. Yes, dance and, and, be, and be joyful. I see you with a spring in your step because the Lord has indeed set you free. He's broken the shackles of religion over you in the mighty name of Jesus. Get thee behind me, O Satan. I am free to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And not familiar spirits. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, soundness of mind to this woman. For you have not given us the spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of a sound mind. Father, in Jesus' name, this woman is free to hear the voice of your Holy Spirit and not familiar spirits. Get thee behind me, O Satan, in the mighty name of Jesus. There's a new vibration, a new frequency bouncing through the walls of your room. In the name of Jesus, a new life, a new consciousness, a new ambience. You know, I want you to go to your seat, Miss Jackson, and just begin to imagine how beautiful your fellowship will be with Jesus going forward. Just go sit there and just begin to see it, visualize it, because I can see it. You see, I see you telling him you have a lot to tell him. And you're so excited as you're telling him and he is listening to you. So just sit there and just begin to bask in the goodness of God and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit. You see, everything that you see as you sit there when it comes to sweet fellowship with the Lord, talking to him, hearing his voice, singing to him, even songs that you will make up. It will be inspired in, in you. It will sound like you're just making up songs. Everything that you see will begin to happen for you speedily in the mighty name of Jesus. But you need to key into it before you leave. So go and sit there and just begin to enjoy it. Let your heart envision that which the Lord has for you. So there's a young woman that the Lord is going to use you to raise up. She's grown, but she's still like a baby. The Lord will give you the patience to teach her even how to change her diapers. Because this is a grown person, looks like, you know, someone almost as tall as you, thereabouts, but they're still a child. And it is not because of humility, but they are a child because of stagnation. A trauma kept them children still. So they suffered trauma when they were about three years old, 36 months. And that trauma has kept them at that age even to the outside world. So they will come to you. I want to, I want to give you something that you will use. Please come. I want to give you something that you will use 
You see what I mean? It is a, it is a, it is a book of secrets. It is a scroll of sword. I see it. I saw it and I said, can I have it for her? And they said, sure. So right now in the mighty name of Jesus, the wisdom to operate in the name of Jesus, you will operate by wisdom and every demon that has taken advantage of them will be cast out at your word. They will receive deliverance. Oh, I'm telling you, and I ask for your sake that there will be a manifestation that you may know that they have been delivered. Do not be afraid. Those tantrums, the screams, the shout, it is the manifestation as the demons are leaving. They will not manifest to remain. They will manifest on their way out. In the mighty name of Jesus, praise the Lord. In fact, they would express the desire for taking up a new name. Just as a sign that you may know that they are the ones of this vision. In the mighty name of Jesus, God bless you. Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you. Get thee behind me, O Satan. I am free to hear the voice of my heavenly Father. Not familiar spirits. Clear your mind. Clear your thoughts. You are free. In the mighty name of Jesus. No more dilly-dallying. No more getting stuck in those thoughts. Just express. You hear. You speak. You declare expressly. In the mighty name of Jesus. You see, I saw a man coming to talk to you like they're interested in your dog. You're walking the dog and they come. They're not interested in that dog at all. They're interested in you. Okay? So, without saying it in the physical, in the spirit, you will look at them and tell them to get thee behind you. Amen. In the mighty name of Jesus. They are an obstruction. They want to get in the way of one that has been sent as an angel to come and minister to you. You see? Oh, yeah. It's always worked for him, but it's not going to work in this case. In the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. I release you to the lost charge in the mighty name of Jesus. Michelle. And when you're standing here, I'm going to just say a different prayer for you. The Bible says whether you turn to the left or to the right, you will hear a voice telling you this is the way. Another one is coming. You kill her? Another one is coming. Another one is coming. In the matter, no, 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 just stay there. He's coming to you. Another one is coming. Both of you, you just stay there. I just want you to know. So, you will hear a voice telling you, This is the way. You will hear that voice. Not voices. Those voices, you came here to renounce them, to walk away from them, to be free to hear clearly. So, you will hear a voice. It is the voice of peace. In the name of Jesus. In all things, even while you're having conversations with people. No more suggestion of multiple ideas. Or maybe you can do this, maybe you can do that. You will just say, this is what I think you should do. Simple. And, and, and that's it. It will be clear. It will be expressed. It will be quick. And it will be known. It will be recognized. Your thoughts, your suggestions will be recognized. Even by the ones who are without as divine. They will just know this is different. Their heart will just know because it, by the time we pierce the veil of their confusion, there is still a spirit within them that can recognize that which is of the Lord in the mighty name of Jesus. It will work for you in the mighty name of Jesus and work through you for others in Jesus' name, Z. So get thee behind me, O Satan. I am free to get thee behind me, O Satan. I am free to hear the voice of my Father and not that of familiar spirits. I am clear in the name of Jesus. The reason why I said I am clear is that once I was praying for you with your hand in mind, the Lord said to me, before her there is an open door. The Bible says there are mountains to climb and there are valleys to walk, but before you there is an open door. You are clear. There is an open heaven above you. Begin to download. You see, don't think of yourself as writing a book. Just think of yourself as, as saving thoughts of your father being expressed to you. Just it's open. The heavens are open above you in this season in the mighty name of Jesus. Kenyatta, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. You will have a divine revelation about money. For those voices to stop, 
Because those voices, some of them stem out of your creativity because of the way you see money. You will have a revelation about money. Let me tell you something, make a note of it. He will have a revelation about money that would allow for you to be able to receive him as the Lord of the Sabbath. As the Lord of the Sabbath. That revelation will bring you into rest. And those other voices will just fizzle because once you hear, once you see, then you will hear. Jehovah is the Lord. Yes. I've been singing this song a lot lately. My wife is like, every time we're in the car now, I play the song. The song, the, the, the hook of the song is in, in her language. I, don't, I have to look at the translation to know what it says, but that song just hit me. I share it in the WhatsApp group. That song I shared in the WhatsApp group, that's the song. Yeah. In that language, I, I, I don't speak that language. They speak that language in my wife's part of the country, but I've learned that statement, Jehovah Meliwo, and it means the Lord has overcome. Is that not what it means? Yeah, the Lord has overcome. And let me tell you something. That was what I heard when I was praying for you. When I said the, Jehovah is the Lord, I heard Meliwo, which means he's the one that overcomes. And so if he is the one that overcomes, it, no strategy can be against him. No policies can be against him. No markets can be against him. He is the Lord of all. And he's also the Lord of harvest. So I expect to reap a bountiful harvest in the mighty name of Jesus. Revelations, a time of revelation. Anybody else? Okay, Charles. So the vocabulary for your, dis for your instruction and direction you're still loading it up. You need to get more aggressive about loading up scriptures so you don't have missing letters in the words of your instruction. So just get aggressive and you will shut those voices down because the voice of God is becoming clearer through his word. So just become more dogged about getting in there. Get thee behind me, O Satan. I will hear the voice of my Father's Holy Spirit and no more familiar spirits. In Jesus' name. Shayla, I'm not done praying for you. I want you to come. I want you to come. Just come as quickly and as straight as you can in the name of Jesus. I'm lifting you up, says the Lord. Rosemary, come. Just give me that hand. This, whatever this hand is, that left hand. I am lifting you up. And the Lord says, yes, it's her left hand because the Lord is saying, I am lifting up the arm that has been weak in the name of Jesus. He's lifting you up. He is lifting you up and he's giving his angels charge. I heard the Lord command the angels saying, make sure it stays up and it will stay up in the mighty name of Jesus. God bless you. Hallelujah. The Lord is bringing you secrets. He's bringing you access to files. You will look at them. I see you looking at them almost like frantically, like you're searching for something. You see, as you seek the mysteries, they will be unveiled to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And so, Lord, in Jesus' name, I pray for you that none of those things in those files will remain hidden to you, but you will know even as you were known in Jesus' name. It's also a season of revelation for you also in Jesus' name. Amen. Who have I not prayed for? Hallelujah. Oh Enlarge your tents. Your heart is being expanded. Make room. Make room in your heart. Make room. Room is being made. Yes, now, even as I speak in the mighty name of Jesus, for you to take in more inspiration, revelation, begin to take in more of awareness. You see, I see you walking around and you're like, oh my God, I'm not alone. No, you're not alone. You are surrounded. You have help. You are surrounded. You are in the company of innumerable angels. So just allow for more room to be made. Get thee behind me, O Satan. I hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and not that of familiar spirits. 
in Jesus' name. Okay, so let me just tell you, because I was like, okay, who is doing the expanding? And I heard that they are helping you. They're expanding it. And then I see the tent being raised. Because what you need, you need more head space. You need more headroom. And you know what that means? I'm going to just tell you simply. You need to make room for angels to help you. You need to make room for, for beings that are taller than you to be able to come in to the space that you're in, to be able to bring in what you need and simply engage them. So there are things that you want to do that you believe needs to be done. Send them on errand and say, ministering spirits, go ahead of me. Secure this place. Saturate the atmosphere before I get there. When I get there, I am going to take, I am going to seize. I am going to possess. I am going to acquire. Go ahead of me. I am only coming behind you all to plunder. You go ahead of me. In the mighty name of Jesus. Make room for help that is higher than you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Is that the last person? I thought I prayed with you already. Okay. Okay. Was you, that was your wife earlier on. Jesus. The Lord is going to show you how to walk out of where you have gone. You see, I see you like you've gone down a corridor in a cave-like structure. And the Lord is dropping you light one step after another. You see, he wants you to, to trace your step back because you would need the knowledge of deliverance. You see, you, you, don't need, you, you don't just need deliverance. You need the knowledge of deliverance. You need to know how it works for the sake of fulfilling your assignment. And so, Lord, I thank you because step by step, you're bringing this man back. You're helping him to recover his mind from where it has wandered. You're helping him to come closer and closer to the origin of your voice and not just the echoes that he continues to hear. In the mighty name of Jesus. So in the name of Jesus, I pray for you to be patient with the Lord's process with you. I pray that you will be vigilant, attentive, and be receptive in this season to every instruction of the Lord and every lesson that he teaches. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Alrighty, God is good. Alrighty. Thank you, big mess. Alrighty, thank you um, for being patient in the presence of God. I know that great things continue to happen in our very midst. Praise the Lord. So Alan is going to come up and receive the offering. And I just want to encourage us again. Somebody said something to me on Saturday. I think it was Antoine. He says, this is fertile ground. Amen. And I'm saying that because I know it is. And I want to encourage you, you know, give in his name into what the Lord is doing here. You see what I mean? Tell yourself, I have chosen to be a helper. You see, because those people who help are also helped. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And I want you to be merciful to that which the Lord is doing in this house. Don't just, you know what it means to be merciful is to give that which is beyond the deserved. Don't just say, well, we only meet twice a week. I'm going to give this amount. No, go above and beyond. Show mercy even in your generosity. Alan, God bless you all. See you Saturday. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord again. Hallelujah. If you need an offering envelope, come see me. To our family online, even here, you'll see the given details on the screen. Cash app, dollar sign, communion house, PayPal, at Communion House. Let's just think on the goodness of God as we prepare our offerings. God is so good. Truly, we have met with him tonight. He has seen about us. God is so good. Hallelujah. So with our offerings prepared, Father, we give you praise for everything that you have done in this meeting tonight. For your mercy endures forever. For you delight in mercy. For your mercy is new 
morning by morning. For your word declares that in you we live and move and we have our being. Father, you have ordered our steps here tonight. You have ordained it. And Father, we give you praise for this opportunity to continue our worship and our giving. Lord, let these acts of obedience, O oh God, if you have encouraged us, especially as of late, by your prophet that you're coming and you're coming to pay out. You're looking upon, O oh God, what we've done. We thank you for the Holy Ghost, for it's only by your Holy Spirit that we can be led into good works. We can be led, O oh God, to follow these instructions by your divine enablement. So, Lord, as we lift up our offerings unto you, let them be pleasing in your sight. Let them be sweet smelling and let your mercy prevail in our lives. All glory and honor belong to you. And we all said, amen. Hallelujah. Come on, let's celebrate the Lord again for such a night of deliverance. Amen. We got something to take home and to run with. Everyone have a blessed night and we'll see you Saturday. Father's Day. Come on. Let's celebrate the fathers in the house. This Saturday. Thank you, Mommy. You don't want to <laughs> you don't want to miss this Saturday. We're going to celebrate the fathers here. Um, and, and we're really going to press in as men. So uh, the fellas here, I see y'all by face. Y'all going to get an outreach from me this week as we lead into that Saturday because we just want to come in excited to celebrate those that the Lord has set before us, okay? God is so good. I'll see y'all Saturday. <laughs>